The same forces that increasingly divide the United States and China are now pushing the United States and India closer together. Although getting its own house in order remains America's top global competitiveness priority, few, if any, bilateral relationships match the potential of closer US-slash-India alignment. There is clearly a great deal of speculation and enthusiasm, but what can we realistically expect over the long course of the 2020s? Can leveraging India really help the United States countervail today's rapidly rising China? The surface case for India as an alternative to China is compelling. While these two nations couldn't be much more different historically, politically, and culturally, both countries also have much in common – decades-long efforts to lift their people out of poverty, vast domestic markets, huge numbers of skilled scientists, engineers, and technicians, large supplies of low-cost labor, a global diaspora of multilingual students, professionals, and entrepreneurs, and deep information technology capabilities. The surface case for closer US-India alignment is also compelling. Both are democracies with strong linguistic, legal, and cultural affinities. And like the United States, India sees China as a geopolitical and military rival. Moreover, India has the potential to become an important global manufacturing hub for US companies seeking an alternative to China, and the giants of the US technology industry are well positioned to succeed in what will soon be the world's most populous nation. Yet, there is another, potentially more worrisome parallel. Although COVID-19 has made America all too aware of its dependence on China for many essential manufactured goods, our rapidly increasing reliance on India for important high-tech services gets far less attention, even as most of America's leading companies have either set up large technology operations in India or continue to rely heavily on India-based IT capabilities. The similarities between the way American enterprises depend on India for IT services and China for manufacturing are striking. Moreover, even if India becomes a stronger partner and ally now, this does not mean they will remain one in the years ahead. Taken together, the interplay between the United States, India, and China will shape global competition and digital innovation for years to come. This paper systemically assesses the outlook of the US-India relationship using this framework and addressing the eight questions shown. We argue that, although the India as a supplier dimension is the most important today, all four dimensions will prove critical over the course of the 2020s, with each requiring a different set of supporting government policies. While there is a wide range of possible scenarios, two things are clear. India should be an essential part of US efforts to compete with and reduce its dependence on China, and this will inevitably expand America's global dependencies from manufacturing to services. This compares statistics for India, China, the United States, and the European Union. Although definitions of terms such as internet users, literacy rates, speaking English, e-commerce, and what counts as STEM – science, technology, engineering, and math – degree very widely, the data reveals some significant messages. China has vastly outperformed India over the last 30 years, and now has an economy and per capita incomes roughly five times as large as India's. China also outperformed India in infrastructure, transportation, mass education, literacy, public health, e-commerce, work opportunities for women, and other domains. India clearly has a lot of catching up to do, and many doubt that it will close these gaps with China anytime soon. However, given India's younger demographics, the long-term picture may prove considerably brighter. Much of the disparity between China and India pertains to productivity growth. For example, China started off with one-third of India's productivity level in 1970. Four decades later, China's labor productivity level is 67% higher than India's. Fortunately for India, it is much safer for a nation to grow productivity faster when it is lagging behind, as opposed to being closer to the forefront. But the total US imports and exports for physical goods to and from India are just one-sixth of those with China. The official story is similar regarding services, with US government data showing the United States importing some $30 billion of all types of services from India in 2019 and running a $5.4 billion annual services deficit. However, we believe the services deficit figure is greatly understated. The respected India IT Industry Trade Organization, the National Association of Software and Services Companies, says that India exported $136 billion in IT services in 2019, with over 60% of this business coming from US firms, which would mean over $80 billion in IT services exports alone to the United States. 
As discussed in the India as a supplier section, IT services are provided, paid, and accounted for in many different ways, some of which seem to have eluded the official trade definitions. Having to acknowledge the real services deficit with India would provide a much-needed US wake-up call. Europe is less worried about digital technology competition from China than the United States is for three main reasons. As shown in the figure, Europe has roughly equal imports and exports to and from China, so it is much less concerned about its overall balance of trade. Additionally, Europe has long been heavily dependent on the United States and Asia in many key technology areas, so its rising dependence on China is much less of a fundamental change. Third, Europe is generally more successful than the United States in exporting advanced industry products to China. Although, if China continues to progress on its self-sufficiency goals, this may change. These three factors explain why getting Europe to be tough on China will likely be harder than many people think. Look at the situation within individual industries, showing which sectors view India mostly as a market, a supplier, a competitor, or some combination. Obviously, reducing such vast and diverse industries to a binary yes or no judgment greatly oversimplifies things, but having shown this figure to numerous industry participants, we think the assessments generally work. The issue of India as a market is discussed in the previous section, and the emergence of India as a competitor is addressed in the following one. In this section, we focus on columns 2, 3, and 4 of these statistics. India as a supplier of IT services, India as a supplier of things other than IT services, and how these two supply-side situations compare and relate to the supply-side challenge from China. The most telling statistic is the 11-2 total shown. Nearly every US private sector industry now relies on Indian IT services in one way or another. The only sectors that tend not to are defense and education, which prefer to do most of their own IT, use domestic-based partners, or both. Overall, US companies source IT services from India in four main ways contracting directly with an Indian IT services, sourcing indirectly from India by procuring services from Western companies, setting up company-owned operations in India, and bringing Indian citizen into the United States to work for their company. These four distinct business models help explain why getting accurate services trade data is more difficult than in many manufacturing markets. They also show how US reliance on India for high-tech services has expanded over the last 20 years. More than 2 million people of Indian nationality, some 600,000 of whom are highly skilled digital professionals, are now working to meet the IT needs of US corporations. This doesn't count the great number of American citizens and permanent residents of Indian heritage now working in tech hubs such as Silicon Valley, research institutes, universities, and other sources of digital innovation. As only an estimated 5 million US citizens are IT professionals, it's clear that India is now an essential part of America's digital ecosystem. Since COVID-19, most of the discussion about India as a supplier has focused on whether US companies can move some of their China-based manufacturing to India or other low-cost nations such as Mexico, Vietnam, the Philippines, and Indonesia. Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan now offer substantial reshoring incentives, and America should do much more in this area if it wants to significantly reduce its China dependencies, as many US companies will need to be pushed, incented, and even shamed into reducing their current China footprints. India is keen to attract manufacturers interested in moving work out of China by both building on its current manufacturing strengths and positioning itself for the growth markets of the future. It also wants to shift from its long history of viewing domestic manufacturing primarily as a means for import substitution to directly targeting global export markets. Industries wherein Indian manufacturing is now strong include chemicals, pharmaceuticals, plastics, textiles, apparel, and steel. The future target list includes mobile phones, semiconductors, medical devices and supplies, automobile parts, batteries, telecom equipment, food products, white goods, textiles, defense production, electronics, solar panels, and, most recently, toys. Just about all of these are major areas of Chinese manufacturing today. To demonstrate that it wants to support global manufacturers, India emphasizes its direct financial support through its production-linked incentive scheme. 
which provides cash incentives for volume manufacturing increases, competitive corporate tax rates, approvals of both joint ventures and 100% ownership structures, infrastructure improvements, low-cost labor, land use reforms, access to the domestic India marketplace, the rule of law, the use of the English language, and free trade agreements with most major markets. Some of these features, particularly the rule of law, could be specially appealing to firms seeking to move from China. The East Asian economic development model has now been in place for more than 50 years, having been successfully adopted by Japan, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, and most recently China. Of course, there are important national differences, but these countries have all prioritized education, especially technical education, infrastructure, global export markets, and a strong, supportive, and strategically engaged state. All five nations also started with commodity manufacturing, and then moved up the value chain to become global leaders in various advanced technology markets. In this case, China can be seen economically as a giant Taiwan, and the fact that it is a communist system may be less central to its economic success than many commentators believe. In all of these cases, US firms chose to use Asian manufacturing because it made them more competitive in the short run. In the case of China, the US motivation was both to compete better with Japan and South Korea and to gain access to the massive China market, which the Japanese government often made contingent on setting up local manufacturing operations. The potential long-term dependency implications of these decisions were a secondary factor at best. Like Japan, Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan, India's global focus was on exports, usually ones relatively low in the value chain and then moving upward over time. While the Indian government has generally been less directly engaged than in the big four Asian countries, NASCOM, founded in 1988, has played a similarly important role in promoting and steering the Indian IT sector. As with Asia, the reason US firms choose to use India is it makes them more competitive in the short term. Once again, the long-term implications have been largely ignored. Looking out over the long term, a key strategic question is whether India might combine a newly gained manufacturing prowess with its advanced digital capabilities to innovate across the entire value chain. Currently, the mostly likely area for this leadership scenario is in pharmaceuticals and biotech, wherein India already has a solid manufacturing base, deep technical talent, and many GCCs successfully serving the global pharmaceutical leaders in areas such as research, analytics, clinical trials, and associated services. If India could extend this approach to other industries, such as electronics, consumer goods, and energy, its overall economic outlook and strategic positioning would improve significantly. The bottom line is, India's IT capabilities in everything from back-office support to cutting-edge R&D are accelerating innovation and helping many US firms stay competitive. However, it seems inevitable that, over time, India will evolve toward being not just a supplier, but a robust competitor. And in this case, the evolution of the software and services industry will likely parallel the competition we have seen with China in manufacturing with many of the potential risks that shift has created. Thus far, we've talked about India mostly as a place, a country where important economic dynamics are in motion. But India is also a people, and the spread of individuals of Indian nationality around the world is now a powerful economic force, particularly in the United States and especially within the IT industry. It's fashionable these days to see the United States and India as natural partners, two democracies working to limit the influence of a rising China. But, of course, this naturalness is only a recent phenomenon. Throughout the Cold War, India was among the leaders of the so-called Non-Aligned Movement, an international organization that sought to avoid taking sides in the competition between the United States and the Soviet Union. As Jawaharlal Nehru noted back in 1946, we propose, as far as possible, to keep away from the power politics of groups, aligned against one another, which have led in the past to world wars, and which may again lead to disasters of an even vaster scale. For many years, important Indian leaders embraced socialism and often had an anti-North attitude. During the 1980s, the United States was much more closely aligned with India's most direct rival, Pakistan. But as the USSR crumbled, Pakistan came to be seen as too close to the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda, India's IT industry flourished, and China loomed. The United States and India were increasingly drawn together. 
a development boosted by the seemingly close relationship between Prime Minister Modi and President Trump, and further accelerated by India's border dispute and previous wars with China. Given China's currently aggressive stance in the region, U.S.-India ties may well strengthen further. We review this familiar history simply to suggest that U.S.-India relations could easily change once again. President Trump is no longer in office. Prime Minister Modi will be 73 when the next India general election is likely in 2024, and India's history of non-alignment could easily resurface. The dispute with China over its largely uninhabited border regions has already faded somewhat. And although the quadrilateral security dialogue between the United States, India, Japan, and Australia provides a framework for collective efforts to curb China, its ability to go beyond the dialogue stage is anything but assured. In short, today's US-India geopolitical alignment may prove to be more fragile than it appears, especially as the potential business interests between China and India are often compelling. As we have seen, there are many complex dynamics that will affect the degree of which the US-India relationship can help offset today's increasingly powerful China. Rather than recap them, these dynamics are summarized via the following pessimistic and optimistic scenarios. Scenario 1. Tensions between India and China are reduced, and the many business synergies between these two neighboring nations come to the fore. The combination of China's manufacturing might and India's software and service prowess provides across-the-board value chain capabilities. The United States remains heavily reliant on both nations, whose market sizes dwarf that of America, giving Chinese and Indian companies colossal economies of scale and leading to large bilateral trade deficits for the United States with both nations. These dynamics ultimately result in world-leading Chinese and Indian universities, companies, and research institutions. Given its relatively small size and many dependencies, there is little the United States can do, as the heart of the global economy shifts to the east and as democratic nations and norms are increasingly seen as failing to keep pace with China's rapid societal progress. Scenario 2. The interests of India and the United States become increasingly aligned, as the economic, military, and international relations challenges from China grow. Rapidly growing Indian manufacturing, much of it from plants moving out of China, helps reduce U.S. dependencies on China while slowing China's growth. At the same time, Indian students continue to flock to the United States, with many staying and making essential contributions to America's technological capabilities. The Indian diaspora creates even more powerful bonds between China and the United States, generating a great many business, political, and cultural leaders. Rising U.S. company dependence on India-based technology services proves to have more benefits than drawbacks and is largely offset by the success of U.S. tech giants in India and by ever-improving cloud services that make extensive customized IT services less necessary. As a result, Indian exports to the United States are broadly matched by U.S. business within India and both nations grow. The combined military prowess of the United States, India, Japan, and Australia and eventually South Korea and Taiwan proves sufficient to prevent China's hegemony within the Pacific region. Democratic norms prevail across most of the developed world, with many developing nations looking to the Delhi model rather than the Beijing model. Clearly, there is a vast middle ground between these two extremes. But by 2030, one scenario will likely prove closer to reality than the other. Which will it be? When we argue that there is now no more important bilateral relationship for the United States than India, this is what we mean. America's technology dependencies on India in the 2020s seem certain to rise. But will the United States be dependent on a strategic partner with strong mutual interests or on an increasingly neutral rival? Much will depend on the strategic choices the Biden and Indian administrations make. The economic and geopolitical stakes could not be much higher. That's it for today's video. Let us know what you think of India rivaling with China in the comments section below. We hope you enjoyed the content of the video. If you did, show some love and hit that like button, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss out on any of the amazing videos we have in store for you.